Welcome to London City Missions Thanksgiving service. Really delighted that you've joined us today. This year, we've got so much to thank God for. We praise God that throughout this dreadful pandemic, we've been able to continue to serve him and the people of London in many different ways. And we give heartfelt thanks for you. I'm really grateful for everything that you do to make our gospel mission in London possible. And most of all, we give thanks to the Lord that he has given us the greatest gift of all, his son, Jesus Christ, and for lives in London that he continues to touch each day by his mercy and his grace. We've got such good news to share with you tonight, and I hope that you will leave here encouraged that the gospel can never be on lockdown. Now, let us worship the Lord together and then see a short video of some of the wonderful work of our dedicated mission team and see what they've been doing during this season of great change. As we start, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness and mercy to the London City Mission throughout this year. Lord, we thank you for those whose lives have been touched by the City Mission. And we pray that you will continue to pour out your grace on the lost in London, that they too may be granted new life through your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for those who are listening tonight and also for those who are speaking. Father, pour out your Holy Spirit into our lives so that we may be reaching out to those around us, that by your grace, many may be touched for the glory of God and for the salvation of souls in London and throughout our nation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I will rest 
in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. Sing, I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. I will rest in your faithfulness. My confidence. It's your faithfulness, oh, faithful you are, faithful forever you will be, faithful you are, oh, all your promises are yes and amen, oh. All your promises are yes and amen. Oh, all your promises are yes and amen. All your promises, all your promises are yes and One in three Londoners are unlikely to hear the gospel in their lifetime. These are people who won't have a Christian friend to invite them to church or introduce them to the hope they can find in Jesus Christ. They are people who may be homeless, people from other faith backgrounds, and people living on some of London's most deprived estates, including older people, children and youth. Our desire is to work alongside the Church of London to share the gospel with those who were least reached. But in March 2020, coronavirus affected us all. It was the marginalised, people experiencing homelessness, older people and those with health issues who were hardest hit. As the pandemic spread across London, we continued to work with churches to share the hope that is found in Jesus Christ with those least likely to hear it. Our activities may have changed, but the desire and urgency to share the gospel didn't. We are out here at uh, Weber Street Homeless Day Centre in Waterloo, um, and even though the guests can't come inside, we can still serve them out here, um, giving them hot meals, teas and coffees, and more than anything, uh, being able to show them the love of Jesus, even though we are in this really strange and difficult time. Obviously, lockdown has had a massive industry. We've had to close the cafe, and we haven't been able to run the Turkish Bible study although we have been trying to keep in touch with people online. So my wife and one other lady who run the English classes have moved on to Zoom and have been trying to keep in touch with people that way. Um, I've been trying to keep in touch with those who come to the Turkish Bible study th through WhatsApp and um, I've had some amazing opportunities to do some uh, in-depth Bible study with, with a number of individuals and one family in particular. Well, I'm speaking from Angel Baptist Church. I'm a part of a group of uh, Islington ministers and on that WhatsApp group uh, the minister uh, Reagan a lovely brother in the Lord shared that they were doing um, preparing meals for about 50 people and what they would like volunteers and I felt God I've been praying and you have now answered the vision originally was to do 50 meals and now it's grown to 250 you know the needs in Islington in the borough uh, where we're working has many needs but we're finding that God is more than able thus far in these few weeks we've done as a team of a dozen volunteers um, about 4,000 meals half of the volunteers are believers in the Lord Jesus and the others are basically not and it's been great opportunities of witnessing uh, there's a lot of fear but we're able to give hope and that hope is only found in Jesus Christ. The Bible studies and one-to-one -one work 
youth groups and toddler groups what we've tried to do is bring them completely online so we've worked with various different platforms that are available to continue the work but just not in a um in direct contact we've developed some um, cooking classes which has been brilliant and the young people involved in those have been really benefiting from just being able to laugh and talk together while cooking food and then we pray with them and give them a bible study and it's really topical talking about pain and and where is god in the whole of this situation why you know is god listening does god listen to our prayers uh, are we being punished we're trying to answer some of the big questions that they have for the last five years, every May half term, we've run a holiday club. It's a, it's a, it's a vital way of, again, supporting those, those families with, with, with young children. But we soon realised with lockdown that wasn't going to be possible. And so what do we do? Well, we went online. We quickly put a team together, um, LCM team and Hope Church Vauxhall team working together in, in partnership. And we put a holiday club called Marvellous Explorers together, where the children met Professor Potty, and we journeyed in his time machine and we journeyed through the Bible together. That was a great way of remaining in touch with some of the families that we regularly see at the centre here throughout the week. It's a great way of building new relationships as well with people. It's only through God's grace and the help of our supporters like you that this work continues. If there was ever a time when London needs Jesus, it's now. It's wonderful to see what God has been doing in London through this time. Thank you. It's your partnership in the gospel that by God's grace makes all of this possible. Before we to hear today's reading, I'd like to introduce our speaker this year, Ephraim Buckle. He joined London City Mission in 2014 as a part-time training manager, helping to establish the LCM Pioneer Programme, which provides equipping for gospel mission for people living amongst the least reached communities who wouldn't otherwise be able to access conventional training. Ephraim was born and raised in Brixton and has planted a church in Lewisham, having received theological training from Oak Hill College and the Urban Ministry Program. Some may recall his fond tribute shared at the funeral of Oak Hill's former principal, Mike Ovey. Now, as the Director of Training and Mentoring and my Deputy Chief Executive, Ephraim seeks to serve the LCM in strengthening gospel impact in London by investing in the best possible training for our missionaries and field staff. We're really very blessed to have Ephraim as a new member of our leadership team. Let's pray for him now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Ephraim. We, we pray for him as he comes and shares your word with him tonight, that he would be inspired by your spirit, uh, filled uh, to be able to uh, speak your word to us, that we would have ears to hear, minds to understand, and hearts ready to be changed in line with your will for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The reading today is from Ephesians chapter 4, 1 to 16. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers 
to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that, so that it builds itself up in love. Amen. Amen. It's such a blessing to be sharing with you today at this our Thanksgiving service. And it being the 185th year of the life of London City Mission, and what a year it has been thus far already. I mean, when we consider the challenges of the Beck Brexit, issues that have been uh, affecting our political narrative, when we consider the protests as it relates to um, racial injustice that we've seen um, throughout the globe, and also, <laughs> nobody could neglect to notice that we're currently in the throes of a global pandemic, um, COVID-19. Um, there are so many factors that have been uh, affecting um, any kind of social and political cohesion um, very, very um, evidently. And yet we see that it's in such a time when we need to give particular attention and strive even harder towards working at our gospel unity. If there were ever a time that people needed to see some kind of unity and cohesion in life, it's definitely now. And um, this isn't an issue that is, is uh, a new issue. This is an issue that has been relevant to the life of the church since Christ himself gave himself for his bride. He gave himself for a people who would be unified. And as we look today at Ephesians chapter 4, as has been read, um, we appreciate that the story of Ephesians, in, a, in an overall sense, um, speaks to that theme of God's new people, God's new society. As we go back to um, chapters 1 to 3, preceding the chapter that we're in now, we recognize that Paul unpacks this reality as it relates to God having a people that he has chosen for himself, that he has brought to himself, by himself, to the praise of his glorious grace. A people who would be diverse in ethnicity, no longer Jew or Gentile, and yet unified. A people who are purposed to reveal his multifaceted glory, as it states in chapter 3. And so, in the previous chapters, the Apostle Paul has established the work of Christ to this end. And from chapters 4 to 6, then goes on to challenge the believer as to how to respond to the finished work of Christ. And so, this matter of unity is the heart of the text that we're looking at. And it's my consideration as we consider gospel unity and what that looks like and how to be given to it and cultivating and nurturing it. It is my consideration that in our quest to achieve unity, we can have a tendency to overemphasize our gifts and abilities knowledge and understanding, even to the extent of undervaluing that of others, seeking to make them more like us in our efforts towards unity, rather than trusting that the Holy Spirit will make them and us 
more like Jesus, who is the true and genuine focus of our unity. And so in our efforts to apply our knowledge and our gifts and our abilities and our perspectives to others, we often do this at the expense of the God-glorifying impact that the gospel is able to have through a unified people. The psalmist said in Psalm 133 verse 1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And so, as we give our attention to gospel unity, this is something that God has purposed and ordained. And I'd like us to consider three things in the brief time that I have. Unity is a given, not merely a goal. Unity diversified is great, not gross. And unity gives strength and stability toward gospel fruitfulness. In verses 1 to 6, the Apostle Paul speaks to the Ephesians as to the basis of our unity and the approach that we ought to have, the posture we ought to take in pursuing unity. He introduces himself as a prisoner of the Lord and he urges believers to live in love in line with your calling in verses 1 to 3. That if we are going to truly seek to see the full expression of the unity that Christ has achieved, first and foremost, it must be one that is characterized by humility, not a, an esteeming of our own perspectives, our own doctrines, our own patterns of ecclesiology, but one that recognizes a humility that all that we have, we have been given. And we don't have anything by way of belief or behavior or practice that we have not received from the Lord. And likewise, there are those who in good conscience hold to the faith, hold to the scriptures, and yet have differences of views on secondary matters. And so we must have humility, walk in gentleness, patience and love as we seek to pursue the full expression of gospel unity. And one of the things that really strikes me in this text here in verse 3 is that the Apostle Paul declares that believers are to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And so this is a unity that already exists. It's not one that we're trying to create, but it's one that we're called to maintain. We cannot in our own strength and in our own ability and in our own wisdom create unity. And we look through the, the experience of humanity and we see that it's, it's yet to happen. And yet Christ alone is the one who is able to forge and achieve true unity. And so unity is something that we have. It is a given not merely a goal. <laughs> there are many who strive for riches, not appreciating, and even at the expense of the riches they already have. There are so many who are seeking material wealth and material gain at the expense of the riches of their family life. It's once said that people will spend their health in order to gain wealth, only after to spend their wealth trying to regain their health. You see, there are so many ways in which we are already rich. And as we look here at the text, Paul is speaking to us by the Spirit and saying, you already have unity. You are already rich in unity. And so therefore, there's a challenge for us not to feel as though we're trying to strive to achieve something that we don't have as if we're chasing a carrot on the end of a stick. 
feeling as though it's always out of reach. But actually, we start on the premise that we are unified, that Christ is the one who has unified us. The apostle goes on in verses four to six to use the word one seven times. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is over all, through all, and in all. That emphasis of repetition is clearly declaring the fact that we are one in Christ, having been made one with God through the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf. And so this is a certain unity that Christ has accomplished, one that supersedes and transcends our efforts. And therefore, it's important. We must not ignore the fact that we are already united because of our differences. We mustn't overlook the fact that we're already, we mustn't question the fact that we're already united because we have differences. Those differences do not contradict the fact that we are united in Christ. If we are to do so, it only serves to undermine our ability to reflect the unity and express the unity that we have. And so we recognize that unity is a given, not merely a goal. And as we see the apostle communicate here, what some have even there to suggest is somewhat of a doxology that there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. Even those brothers and sisters who profess a credible faith in Christ Jesus, who stand on the essentials of the faith, who wholeheartedly are convicted of the truth of the Apostles' Creed, who are committed and submitted to Christ as Lord in the essentials of the faith, and yet may not be like us in whatever way. This is telling us that that's okay. Even where their differences may grieve us, God is over us all, and we will all give account to him. And even though it may not be in the way that we would do it, God is working through them nonetheless. And even though we may be dubious, God is in them, just as he is in us. All. And this was to be purpose to the display of God's glorious grace. It's interesting here because we see mention of the triune God. One spirit, one Lord, one God and Father of all. And there is a sense, an underlying sense in which the unity of the saints is to be an expression and a reflection to the glory of the unity of our triune God. Even as I stand here at All Souls, I acknowledge that in not too distant church history, great men of God have wrestled over this. The late great John Stott, and Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones expressed public difference about the basis of unity. And it is in light of this that we are reminded 
Yes, much ground has been covered since then, but there is still a need for us to come together. This quote is definitely helpful. Um, a quote that I first became familiar with um, from the Puritan Richard Bra Baxter. In the essentials, unity. In the non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. And so as we recognize our unity, let us also recognize that unity diversified is a great thing, not a gross thing. Like the triune nature of the Godhead, diversity does not violate, but rather it invigorates our unity, enabling God's glory to be more powerfully revealed to the lost. And there's a sense of this as we look at verses 7 to 12. In verse 7, Paul speaks of the grace that has been given to each one according to the measure of Christ's gift. And so he goes from the macro for a moment to the micro. And he says, each individual believer has received a gift of grace. According to the measure of Christ's gift. And so there's a sense of saving grace. We've received the gift of salvation. And as a result, we have become beneficiaries of serving grace. Each individual, however different, however diverse, has an individual contribution to make. You have a contribution to make to the revealing of God's glory in this life and times. And that sense of individuality helps us to appreciate that my expression of God and his purpose outworked in my life may not necessarily look like the person next to me, the person in front of me or behind me, the person that I sit next to, well, on Zoom <laughs> in a service, or those who may be the ministers in my church, those who are in my congregation. But each has received saving grace, and having received saving grace, have received serving grace. This is expanded on. Every Christian is a gifted gift through the conquering work of Christ. And so in these next verses where we see talk of descending and ascending and gifts being given, there's a sense of Jesus having descended from heaven. The incarnation is implied here. And having taken on the likeness of sinful men, he gave himself in order that all who would believe might be saved. And having done so, he conquered sin, Satan. And he set the captives free. In Psalm chapter 2, the father says to the son, ask of me and I will give the nations as an inheritance for you. And there is this sense being expressed here that Christ as the conquering champion, the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah, has ascended on high with a train behind him of vanquished foes. And those among that train are not just those who have been subjugated, but those who have been captivated by the conquering Christ. The Father has presented the bride, his people, to the Son as a gift of whom we are among. And yet, Christ has given gifts to those that are his and given those who are his as a gift to others. And so we see in verses 11 and 12 that he has appointed ministry gifts that of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. 
some would say the gift of offices. Why? In order to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. And so in this, there is a beautiful expression of God's grace to be outpoured through those who have been appointed. And we appreciate that the apostles and prophets, and there's again a, a macro view here as it speaks of the apostles and prophets. Paul had previously said in chapter 2, verse 20 of Ephesians, that the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ being the chief cornerstone. And so that foundation has been laid, and you only lay the foundation of a building once. And so that has been established, fulfilled, and completed. And we don't have apostles and prophets in a capital A, capital P sense as were present then. And those, those offices have been fulfilled, and that is further affirmed by the fact that Christ is the chief cornerstone of the foundation. And that foundation will not be laid again. It has been fulfilled and established. And so in this, the ministry is to equip the saints, to equip the body. For, and there's a wonderful sense of outpouring that will go out into the world to see the lost added and the church built up just as you and I have been added to the church through the ministry of the Apostles' Doctrine, Acts 2, as ministered by evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And yet, as we move on, we see that it's not just a quantitative growth building up, but a, a qualitative growth also expressed. In verses 13 to 16, we see that unity gives strength and stability to the body, to the glory of God. In verse 13, we are told that this work of, the, of equipping the saints is to continue until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood. And there's this sense of the body growing up to be like Christ in all his fullness. I've recently become a grandfather and um, my granddaughter, she's a little cutie. Um, I, I was with her yesterday and I took her foot in my hand and I looked at her foot and I thought, hmm, you've got good sized feet, a bit like your granddad. But it, that suggests to me that you're going you're gonna to be as tall as your mum because her mum, my daughter, is about my height. She gets her height from me. And, and I just looked at her in her small, not even a toddler stage yet, crawling rapidly just this week. It's, it's been an amazing thing to watch. But she's only just beginning her journey of growth but I see all the signs that she's gonna grow into the fullness and stature of that of her mum. And as we are strengthened in the faith through the nourishing work of ministry, ministering one to another, we are built up with a view to grow into the fullness and stature of Christ. But we need each other for that. There is a, a diverse expression of ministering to one another that will help to accomplish that for us. And that diversity is key, just as having a diverse and balanced meal is key. Can you imagine if every meal you ate only had one ingredient? How boring would that be? And yet we see that God has purpose through the diverse nature of the unity of the saints, we would be built up and established. And so, as I seek to conclude, I would encourage us, we may have understanding, yet still much that we can learn from each other. 
even those who don't think the way we do, even those who may have different views to us. We may have strength and capability, but we still need each other's partnership in this task that is unfinished. Gospel unity is a necessity to the fervence of the gospel and the glory of God in our time. David Naismith, he was very aware of this. And just a few years after starting London City Mission, he actually resigned his post for fear of the threat that separatism between Anglicans and nonconformists, the threat that it would have to the effectiveness of the work of the mission and the fervence of gospel proclamation. Such was his concern that he didn't want to endorse any kind of separatism because he felt it would undermine that mission. And so, in the essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Because London needs Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray, Lord, that you would apply it to our hearts and lives. And may we be individually, corporately, and as a mission, be strengthened by it as we press on for your glory. Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my soul. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving ceases, my comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in hell, blessed pain. This gift of love and righteousness Scorned by the ones he came to save Till on that cross, says Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ, I live. There in the ground, his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine. Bought with the precious blood of Christ. Oh. Mm. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. 
from life's first cry till final breath jesus commands my destiny no power can no scheme of man can ever walk me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand no power of hell no steep of man can ever block me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand. So Mike is an old friend of the mission and an old friend of mine personally, actually. And um, uh, uh, Mike has uh, led a church uh, in Dagenham for, for many years. You were a uh, parish? I was vicar for 20 years in Dagenham Parish Church. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, really uh, busy in, in all kinds of different uh, kind of Anglican movements, things like the Reform Movement, and then later on in the Renew Movement. And then you went on to lead a, a church plant in the middle of the a Dagenham Council Estate uh, with the help of LCM to reach uh, out into the local community. Um, could you just tell us a bit about what that church did? Sure. Uh, we decided there were two vital ingredients for evangelism. You need a Christian, you need a non-Christian, and you need them together. And uh, we decided that the non-Christian didn't have all that much incentive to come to us, but we had every incentive to go to them. And given that we lived in a very large, uh, fairly sink council estate and people were around we thought we'd go to them in their own homes oh i mean um a bit like jw's going door knocking and stuff yeah well the opposite see the jw's what do they get wrong they turn up unexpected they come up with a pre-lunch spiel and then you never see them again Take what they do and the opposite. And we know that actually only Jesus loves JWs, but we thought that actually if we were the opposite, we might get somewhere. So it's a turning up unexpected. We send a letter in advance explaining why we're coming. We just were local Christians, wanted to get to know people in our area. Explaining when we're coming, Sunday between 2 and 3.30. And then to... Um, and give them the opt-out clause, which is, we'd love to see you, but some people would rather we didn't. Please just let us know we won't trouble you. And so the letter goes in advance. That's the first way we're different. Second way we're different, we talk about the person we're interested in on the doorstep rather than what we have prepared to say. So you want to get to know you. Just where, have you lived here long? So you ask the factual questions where they've got the answers. You say, well, do you know lots of people around here? Um, you've got a family nearby. Who do you turn to when the bomb goes off? That sort of thing. So you get to know people and you get to chat to people and they love to talk about themselves. It's their favorite topic of conversation. So you're on a roll. And then the third thing we say, and incidentally, we're from a local church. Have you ever been to church yourself? What do you think about that sort of thing? And normally, people haven't done much thinking about God, and they've got God wrong. And it's our chance to say, look, I don't think that's um, fair to say that of him, that no one knows what he's like. What if he's actually come and helped us to understand that really well? It's a bit like Athens. In Athens, uh, Paul spoke to, spoke to these Athenians, and he said, look, you've got lots of gods, and you're feeding him. Don't you think actually it's the other way around that God looks after us? And it's that kind of helping people get a bigger picture of Jesus, just in a natural relational way. And then the third thing we do, having spoken relationally, which JWs don't, the third thing we do is not 
disappear and never turn up again. We actually turn up with a handwritten, with a fountain pen, you must do this, um, with a fountain pen, say thank you very much for your time. It was really lovely hearing about uh, uh, your uh, brother getting into university or whatever it is we speak about, make it personal. But then say something about, well, you did mention something about Jesus. Uh, and I just wanted you to, to think a bit more along these lines and say something about him in a way that reinforces the conversation and they've got it handwritten in their hands, a personal tract if you like. So that's what we did to actually try and give people on the estate a serious 2020 on the gospel in a way that they could take in. Fantastic. Um, so how did, how did the London City Mission help you with this outreach? Well, in the great kindness of God, I think the Holy Spirit was moving way back in 2014 to begin to steer London City Mission to do evangelism the way the Bible sets us up to do it, which is through the local church. And so um, we had conversations and uh, you very generously said, uh, here are the keys to uh, the center uh, on that estate. Uh, the place is yours, use it. Uh, and you don't pay rent, and we'll give you a missionary as well. And the generosity of LCM, and I guess your supporters really helped us to get going. And in the kindness of God, we were able to then pay a, the right amount, uh, a realistic amount, for those costs or towards them. But the point is that that heart of LCM for evangelism now directed away from, I guess, the chaplaincies that they were involved in, but now moving into doing it through local churches. That was an immense lift for us. We just simply couldn't have done it because you essentially got on the side of the local church and said, how can we do this? And through the local church, other local churches were fired up by what you did. Because what happened was actually there are other places in the country that said actually, we want to know how to help Christians, non Christians, to come together in a fairly sane and non weird kind of way. And so they started coming. In fact, I was chatting to Vicar last week. He said, I'm the most introverted guy going. I thought I would never do this. And you got me doing this because. So they sent people from their church to come visiting with our church members. And so therefore, what you had was essentially a church training a church. So LCM were encouraging the church to evangelize, and the church was and training another church to evangelize. And we went out on the doors together until they got confidence to do it on their own. So it was a, a wonderful way of ultimately the local church doing this work of training up others because in the end it is the local christians sheep make sheep shepherds don't make sheep so you need to get the local church as the theme of the evening is uh, to encourage people for works of ministry and that is how lcm got behind us and enabled us to get behind other churches as well praise the lord uh what can we be thanking God for in all this, Mike? Well, um, despite all the help and encouragement, it is a very nerve-wracking thing to start a new church. And in the goodness of God, uh, he kept us. Uh, my wife and I would drive home after Sunday evening thinking, well, there's another, another week that we've done together. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not smooth sailing, and it is... Uh, uh, hard work, but boy, it brings great joy. And the Lord gave us that and kept us uh, on task and uh, doing that. 
Um, but the second thing he did, because he started with 11, which is a very fragile, small, vulnerable group, and only the uh, great hand of God on you will keep you step after step going forwards. The other thing that he did, I think, was he grew us, um, which was, was wonderful. Um, numbers, like in any other church, go up and down. Uh, we had a whole gang of Iranians joining us at one point when Dagnum became the place where asylum seekers were sent. And so therefore, God revealed himself. Uh, some were calling us along, um, but others were genuinely seeing God reveal himself, which was wonderful. Um, then another season, he took us into the world of cocaine addicts. And so we invited cocaine addicts into the center, and we were able to uh, begin relationships there and begin to uh, explain Jesus. And so for a time, that ministry opened up. And so therefore, you know, there's been, as in a, 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 a different multi-ethnic uh, patch, there are loads of different ways in which you get into almost every group because you're doing every home. You're not targeting anything special. You're going, this is a shotgun. You go for everyone. And whoever it is you've got in front of you, you've got to relate to them. And, and we've got to learn how to do that. So... Wonderfully, God took us into these new areas. And, and then the church grew, and, and I think about 60% of the church came from the local estate, um, so that we weren't actually attracting people from uh, all sorts of other places. Everybody could walk. And not just, I don't think you could just measure um, effectiveness by what comes in through the door. But the fact is, we knocked on 6,000 doors and we wrote, hand wrote, over 2,000 thank you cards, we call them, but essentially, as I said, little gospel tracts personalized for 2,000 homes. Mm -hmm. And again, the wonderful encouragement of that. Um, you write these little tracts and uh, a guy turned up uh, one evening. And uh, he turned up, he's a 20-year-old with a 19-year-old sister and a 19-year-old friend. Three young people turn up. And I said, he'd love to see you. Why, why are you here? And he pulls out of his pocket this, 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 this handwritten tract with brown ink all over it. I could recognize the handwriting. I said, but, but the ink is brown. Um, how do you get that way? He said, well, we had the tract. And we put it on the fridge, and the fridge caught the sunlight, and then the... Uh, that the ink became discolored. Um, and I took another look at it and said, this is five years ago. He said, oh, yes, we changed the fridge, but we kept the card and we stuck it on the new fridge. And now we thought we'd better come. <laughs> and so he comes in with these two, with these two uh, other youngsters. And they kept coming, and he started joining our midweek work. And you know, it was just a real time of encouragement then. As these things happened, he got a non-Christian girlfriend, and... Um, so that, but what he, what he received in that time um, will, in the goodness of God, I think, over time, bring, come back into his head and maybe in another place uh, he'll become uh, more uh, faithful and committed. So it is our work, isn't it, to, to essentially sow the seed like the farmer in the parable. And ultimately, that's our job. And he says, uh, go and make disciples. I don't know whether our ears are funny, but generally when we see go in the Bible, we hear gather. And so Christians generally hang out together. Whereas when you go and reach that whole council estate as we try to do, we know that that's us doing our work. Praise the Lord. And God will do his work, which is to help people to be born again. Thank you so much, Mike, and praise the Lord, and may God continue to bless both uh, you and uh, the family and also the work in Dagenham. Uh, there will be many praying for you. Uh, God bless your work. Well, uh, please may I now introduce you to Gareth Jones, who has been 
doing a fantastic job working alongside local churches as a missionary team leader, uh, sharing the gospel in Tower Hamlets. And we're so pleased to have recently appointed into a new role as field director. Gareth will now have a responsibility for ensuring that we take a London-wide approach to reaching children and youth and schools, reaching them with the good news of Jesus today. Uh, today, though, Gareth is going to share with us his previous experience of working alongside local churches in Tower Hamlets. And following this, our chairman, Mark Harding, will close our time together. Hi. Firstly, it's amazing to be at the Thanksgiving service and I uh, want to give thanks to God, really, for all he's done in this last year. And uh, big thanks to you guys as well, because uh, without your prayers and without your giving, none of this would be possible. Um, I've been working on the, uh, in Tower Hamlets as the team leader, and I just want to share a little bit about a partnership with a church called Tower Hamlets Community Church on the Isle of Dogs. So uh, they launched uh, a church plant, and uh, just to kick that off, really, we, there was a lady called Sarah who got involved with uh, community activities we were doing on the island and uh, the church were doing in partnership with us. And she came along to Christianity Explored. And she said she loved getting into the Gospel of Mark and learning more about Jesus. Uh, and actually, when COVID-19 hit, uh, Christianity Explored went online. Uh, and she continued to do the course online um, and actually eventually gave her life to Jesus, which is amazing. And then she uh, started inviting her friends along uh, as well. So lots of people were coming online because of her witness. And uh, Sarah continues to grow and becomes part, becoming part of that church on the Isle of Dogs. Um, so ways we're partnering uh, with the church. Um, so initially we got involved because they were wanting to use one of our buildings on the Isle of Dogs to run the church plant. But I was drawn into the leadership uh, of, of the uh, plant on the island. They wanted me to consult on the church plant. We got involved with some door-to-door, -door, taking some of their people onto the local estates. We also did a big summer program with them. Um, so the plan with the summer program really was that uh, we initially would take the lead and they sent lots of volunteers. But this year, the plan was that they would take the lead on that as well. So really that transitional uh, relationship where we would inspire and mobilize and they would get people uh, out onto, into the community to, to reach the least reached in those communities. They also run a uh, mum and tots group they called uh, Little Lights. And again, it was drawing in, in our center, drawing people in from that community. So there's lots of different ways we can partner with them and continue to partner with them. Uh, one other way was as well was something called Believe in Jesus campaign. And that was really taking the Easter story onto the streets, particularly into the Muslim community. Um, and the church, Tahamlitz Community Church, brought lots of volunteers again, as well as other churches in the area. And that was amazing because what we saw there was alongside our missionaries were normal, everyday church folk taking uh, the gospel and, and presenting it in a way that the Muslim community could understand. And everybody who came out was so inspired uh, as, as they sort of began to see that people were interested in what they had to say. Uh, there was one other guy uh, connected with those uh, community activities that we did. And uh, he was from a Muslim background. Uh, he came along and again got involved with Christianity Explored, had loads of questions, was always the first to arrive and the last to leave the group. And again, as a result of that, he's connected into online church and he's on a real journey to find uh, Jesus for himself. So do, do pray for him as he continues to seek the Lord. So I just want to end really by saying, you know, Luke 10 verse 2 tells us that the harvest is plentiful. Uh, and I just want to encourage you that there's lots of opportunities out there. As we partner with THCC, we see that the harvest is plentiful. There's lots of opportunity to get involved and to share the gospel with your community, with the least reached in your community. But the workers are few. And we really want to uh, continue to engage with Tower Hamlets Community Church and with many churches across London to see many workers raised up for the harvest field. Good evening. It's great to be with you here this evening. It's a shame we can't meet in person. Uh, we always enjoy, as I'm sure you do, these opportunities uh, to give thanks to God for his 
faithfulness over the previous year. And this year we're able to give thanks for 185 years of faithfulness. We're very well aware that uh, this has been a difficult year, not just for the mission and many missionaries, but no doubt for many of you and for the people of London. And we stand with all of you. Thank you very much for your faithful support. Thank you for your prayer. Each year I say this, but uh, I don't mean it any less each year. We do covet your prayers. We know that without prayer, uh, our plans will not succeed. Uh, so thank you for that. Thank you too for your financial support. We know that many have given sacrificially over the last year to the work of the mission. We normally, as you know, take up uh, an offering at the end of this service, and if we were physically present, we would, but we can't do that. So uh, you will receive an email after the end of this uh, service, giving you uh, instructions as to how to make an offering uh, if you want to. Uh, or if you don't want to uh, use that, then do go to our website, which will tell you how to do that. Uh, I want to thank to those who put in so much hard work uh, in making this possible uh, this evening. Uh, as you might imagine, a lot of work's gone into it. So let's uh, close in prayer, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for 185 years of your faithfulness to London City Mission. We thank you for your faithfulness over this last year and for all the work that you've done through the mission. We realize that we stand in the shoes of giants who started the mission and worked through difficult times of wars and cholera and famine and difficulties galore. And as we start a new chapter of the mission, we want to come to you and ask that you would walk ahead of us and prepare the ground for the work you want the mission to do. We pray you know, your goodness and blessing on this mission, on its people, on its supporters. So let me finish with the last two verses of the third chapter of Ephesians. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power, that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.